Gaming has a few absolutely massive franchises for which every single release is an event. Your Legends of Zelda, your Resident Evil, your Pimps My Ride the video game. Possibly that's just me. But while these game franchises might be absolutely massive, some of them are hiding in their long and storied histories obscure games that most people won't have even heard of, let alone played. Here then are seven obscure games from huge series that we can almost guarantee you've never even heard of. Enjoy! The Elder Scrolls series is one of the longest running and most successful video game franchises ever, and fifth main entry, Skyrim, has been re-released, updated and ported so many times that you can play it in virtual reality, as a board game and even on an Alexa. Uh, I, I drink a health po potion. You are out of health potions. Oh, uh, oh uh, how many uh, wheels of cheese do I have left? 473. I eat all the cheese. I eat all of the cheese. What you may be less aware of, however, are the Elder Scrolls Travels games, a series of Elder Scrolls RPGs made for mobile phones. These included the Elder Scrolls Travels Stormhold and the Elder Scrolls Travels Dawnstar, both of which came out for Java-enabled mobile phones in 2003 and 2004, respectively, which alternated between first-person dungeon crawling and dialogue with NPCs, which made it look a bit like you were getting text messages from LARP enthusiasts. Obscure, yes, but people did actually own Java-enabled cell phones. Even less likely to have been played by anyone currently watching this is the third game in the series, The Elder Scrolls Travels Shadow Key, which came out exclusively for the ill-fated Nokia N-Gage, universally regarded as one of the most disastrous consoles of all time. While it's easy to make fun of the N-Gage because it sucked and was bad and looked like an air conditioning control panel, Shadow Key was a decent attempt at making an Elder Scrolls game on some very limited hardware, and included a lot of the elements that make the series so popular, including character creation, first-person exploration and combat, and a lore-heavy story based around a brewing magical war. Gotta say though, that is the worst font I've ever seen. What's this about dongers? Okay, glad we cleared that up. Obviously, the N-Gage was a giant failure, and that pretty much killed off the Elder Scrolls Travel series. There was one plan for the PS Vita, Elder Scrolls Travels Oblivion, but that was cancelled, and now what are we supposed to do if we want to play an Elder Scrolls game while on the move? Oh right, we could play that perfect conversion of Skyrim for the Nintendo Switch. I guess that'll have to do. capacity as Nintendo mascot as well as video game star, Mario has shown up in countless games where you might not expect to find him, appearing as, among other things, a boxing referee, archaeologist, and of course, scrappy street baller with hoop dreams. Oh. <laughs> Probably the most obscure Mario game of all time though is the Mario sewing game. <laughs> Weird, I read that as sewing. What, with a needle and thread? Sewing. Sewing? Yes, I was Okay. Mario actually featured in two garment-making games released 15 years apart. The first, which came out in 1986 for the Famicom, was called I Am A Teacher, Super Mario, No Sweater. This game allowed you to create custom Mario-themed knitting patterns, which you could then send by post to a Japanese textiles company who would make the sweater for you. Following hot on its heels a short 15 years later in 2001 was sewing game Mario Family for the Game Boy Color, which has the distinction of being the last Mario game for that console. Presumably that's because this was the pinnacle of everything they felt the character could achieve at this point in his career. The good news for players was that Mario Family could be linked to the Jaguar JN100, a sewing machine which would embroider your design onto fabric for you, without you having to post anything to anyone. The bad news was that the Jaguar JN100 sewing machine cost $600. 
This made Mario Family even less accessible somehow, dooming Mario's embroider em up to eternal obscurity. It sold so poorly that the idea of a Kirby themed sequel was summarily canned. It didn't help that in Mario Family all you could really do was add or remove the approved palette of colours to a set of pre-made template designs, not redesign them entirely to make Mario and Wario kiss or anything, which makes me think that Nintendo are probably saving that one for an official merch drop. In the meantime, the best we've got is sad grayscale Mario here. With the release of Mass Effect Legendary Edition, Bioware has bundled together the Mass Effect games into a slick HD package with graphical improvements, gameplay tweaks and content updates, like changing Tali's infamous bedside photo so it's no longer a stock photo of a catalogue model with some antenna photoshopped on. You may notice, however, that an important entry in the Mass Effect series is missing from this bundle, a game that might be a bit more obscure than the others in the series, but nevertheless is worthy of mention. Whoa, 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 why are you showing Mass Effect Andromeda? Get this out of here! That's better. I am, of course, talking about Mass Effect Galaxy, which came out for the iPhone in 2009 and which, to be fair, probably reviewed even worse than Mass Effect Andromeda. Released just before Mass Effect 2 came out, Mass Effect Galaxy let you play as Mass Effect 2 squadmate Jacob Taylor in a top-down shooter that you're barely in control of, in that you had to tilt your phone to move Jacob around while he automatically shot at enemies for you. In between the combat sections, we get some of the Mass Effect series' trademark conversations, with Jacob, looking nothing like Jacob, chatting to various friends and enemies, picking between different Paragon and Renegade conversation options. I'm not seeing any romance options though, which is odd considering the obvious chemistry between Jacob and Miranda. and Jacob and Captain Tudge. And Jacob and this Batari warlord. Look, stop beating around the bush, Bioware, and just make a Mass Effect visual novel dating sim. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'm making some headway with this space pirate romance. Street Fighter 2 was such an enormous success that it triggered a wild scramble to release as many tie-in games, cartoons, board games and action figures as possible, and obviously not all of them are going to be as amazing as the original game. I'm going to kick Bison's ass. I don't think so. At least the movie was great. Stone Cold classic right there. Believe it or not though, the most obscure Street Fighter game from this era isn't even Street Fighter colon the movie colon the game, which gave us the high concept spectacle of a video game based on a movie based on a video game. No, that dubious honour belongs to Street Fighter 2 The Interactive Movie, which was released exclusively in Japan for the PlayStation and Sega Saturn. A tie-in to this Street Fighter anime movie, Street Fighter 2 The Interactive Movie had you playing as a Shadaloo cyborg sent by M. Bison to monitor fighters from around the world to learn their secrets and grow stronger. What this meant in practice was watching scenes from the Street Fighter anime movie and pressing a button to take photographs at crucial moments that would allow you to analyse the different fighters' moves, stats and fighting styles. King. Hmm, yes, I see. Kicking writing this down. Taking pictures of the right things would boost your cyborg's stats, with the end goal being to fight and defeat Ryu. You could see how you were getting on between scenes by fighting a Ryu hologram who would usually kick your robot head in because you were a slow-ass cyborg with Ken's moveset but no actual power or defence and also you looked like a cast-off from Rise of the Robots. Round two, fight. 
watch enough grainy movie to level up enough, and you could face off against the real Ryu and get the chance to change Street Fighter history by beating him in single combat, at which point M. Bison would congratulate you and then somehow become President of the United States despite not being born there, or from there, or having any connection to politics. But it turns out Ryu is fine, actually, and they start fighting again. Which to be fair, is better than Ryu's ending in the actual original proper Street Fighter 2. I worked hard for that trophy, Ryu. We all know the main Legend of Zelda series, mostly because it's also a pretty functional list of the best video games ever made, from Ocarina of Time to Breath of the Wild. Because of how beloved the Legend of Zelda series is, even its more obscure entries are reasonably well known, as is the case with Tingle spin-offs like Rosy Rupee Land and the terrible Zelda games for the Philips CDI, like Wand of Gamelon. Yeah, that old Ganon's no match for the king. The most obscure Zelda game of all time, however, is Legend of Zelda Ancient Stone Tablets for the Satellaview, a satellite modem peripheral for the Japanese Super Nintendo equivalent, the Super Famicom, that was released in 1995. Satellaview. The way the Satellaview worked was by sending out satellite broadcasts that Satellaview owners could download on their consoles at specific times. Legend of Zelda Ancient Stone Tablets was originally broadcast in 1997, and then rerun three times during the Satellaview's lifespan, meaning there were only four opportunities for Zelda fans to get to play it, which I think qualifies it as the most obscure Zelda game in history. Yes, even more than the Japan-only Tingle games. Oh, I've got to stop mentioning Tingle Games, there's always a clip. Ancient Stone Tablets was fairly unique among Zelda games in that you didn't play as Link, but rather as yourself, or at least your Satellaview avatar plonked down into a game world very reminiscent of the one from SNES Zelda Adventure, A Link to the Past. The story, set six years after Link to the Past, sees your avatar being transported to Hyrule and roped into a plan to recover eight ancient stone tablets that will help defeat the returning forces of Ganon. Link has left the country apparently, which is why you have to do it. I don't know, maybe he's on holiday. The unique way that the Satellaview worked made this unlike any of the more well-known Zelda games. In fact, it was more like a playable TV show in that the game was divided into hour-long playable episodes, four of which were broadcast a week, with two weekly stone tablets for players to get, building to the season finale after all eight were acquired. The online element of the game also meant that it could include timed events like weather effects, spells, or periods of unlimited ammo that players could take advantage of. It was also fully voiced thanks to the Satellaview's SoundLink feature, which streamed a full vocal track alongside the game, with voice actors discussing the plot or giving players direction, as seen here in the Satellaview's previous Zelda game, Zelda no Densetsu. In short, Ancient Stone Tablets, while probably being the most obscure Zelda game ever, also sounds like one of the most interesting. It even used the internet to feed players' scores back to the developers, and the top scoring players could sometimes win prizes, like memory packs for the Satellaview. Which, I mean, now I'm wondering where my prizes are for playing Breath of the Wild. I have a Nintendo Switch Online membership, Nintendo. Why am I not being mailed fabulous prizes? Is it because I'm bad at Breath of the Wild? Because I don't see how that's relevant. The Doom series has been letting players frag demons in increasingly gory and overblown ways for nearly 30 years, from 1993's original Doom 
to 2020's Doom Eternal. It's been a bad three decades to be a demon, basically. Fans of demon killing who prefer to take things at a slightly slower pace, however, might be pleased to learn that there exists a Doom RPG, released for mobile phones in 2005. Now normally, the letters RPG in the vicinity of Doom would have your mind immediately going to a rocket-propelled grenade being fired into the giant, unblinking eye of a luckless cacodemon. Here though, they stand for role-playing game, because this version of Doom for cell phones wisely chose to turn the standard Doom action into a much slower paced and thoughtful dungeon crawler. Because have you ever tried playing a shooter on a phone? Exactly. While it was the right decision, it's still very weird to see Doom, the most metal video game series in existence, turned into a sci-fi version of a dungeon crawling RPG with things like critical hits, an item shop and XP that you use to level up your stats. There was also greater emphasis on conversations with NPCs and reading terminals to learn more about the game's story, which Another big change, I guess. It had a story. Added to this were puzzle elements, including items you needed to pick up, such as a fire extinguisher for putting out blazes and an axe for chopping down broken doors. <laughs> or smacking monsters in the face, I guess. That too. Weirdest of all, combat takes the form of turn-based skirmishes, which means you end up with these very polite fights where everyone lines up to get smacked in the face with an axe. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining. I think you're onto something, Doom RPG. All right, everyone, form an orderly queue. We all know what Uncharted games are like, right? Epic, sprawling adventures that span the globe, involve ancient treasure, and include at least one scene where hero Nathan Drake falls off something while shouting, oh crap. A classic formula. And while that is indeed true for most Uncharted games, it isn't the case for the most obscure title in the series, Uncharted Fight for Fortune. That's because Uncharted Fight for Fortune is a digital collectible card game that came out on the PlayStation Vita, a one-two double whammy of limited mass market appeal on par with a new line of anime body pillows featuring characters from C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. By all accounts, Uncharted Fight for Fortune was a perfectly serviceable CCG. Sure, it's no Hearthstone, but the cards do all feature Uncharted characters, so you can look at them and imagine what it would be like if you were, say, playing a much more exciting Uncharted game. One neat touch was that Fight for Fortune linked up with PS Vita Uncharted spin-off Golden Abyss, so the treasures discovered in that game would be converted into power-up cards that you could use in your Fight for Fortune matches. Or, and here's a wild idea, you could just carry on playing Golden Abyss because that was a proper Uncharted game with jumping and stuff. Just a thought. Alright, listen, when you jump, just make sure... <coughs> Sorry, you are saying? Thank you so much for watching this video about sequels, but have you heard about the prequels to this video? Uh, there's hundreds of them, and they're all in this playlist over here, so uh, enjoy those. Oh, also, before you go, if you could click the like button and hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed already, and if you really, really want to help us out, hit the little bell notification icon uh, to be notified of future videos. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.